today's event at this year's Swindon Festival of Literature, which as a result of restrictions to prevent the spread of that virus has become a virtual online festival of literature. Thank you very much for joining us. We do hope that everything is well where you are. We're both pleased and grateful that human ingenuity, cutting edge science and digital technology make it possible for this show to go on, or at least to go on online. <clears throat> now, at the start of chapter two, today's guest author quotes Aaron Copeland saying this, if a literary man puts together two words about music, one of them will be wrong. By the way, his book has great quotes at the start of every chapter, including some by W.B. Yeats, W.H. Davis, and so on. Anyway, heeding the Aaron Copeland warning, I will restrain myself and in this intro speak only of the writing in the book, not the music, and say that today in the newly published Beeswing, Fairport, Folk Rock, and Finding My Voice 1967 to 75, we have one rich book, rich in stories, rich in detail, rich in a particular musical history, and ever so rich in life experiences. And it has an appendix A with the words of all the songs quoted in the book. By the way, folks, Beeswing is on page 234. <laughs> and it has an appendix B with some of its author's dreams, with Jesus, Joni Mitchell, and Keith Richards featuring in them. This, I can tell you folks, is one unputdownable book, but we'll come to it. Now today we have two guest interviewers, both admirers of today's guest author. Uh, they are both accomplished singers and musicians in their own right. Please join me now in giving a Swindon <coughs> Festival of Literature welcome to guest interviewers, Sarah Yastine and Linda Lee, and most of all, to today's guest author, singer and songwriter, Richard Thompson. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm. Pleasure to be here. It's Thank a pleasure, pleasure to have you here, Richard. This is fun. Mm, thank you. Do I, get, do I get to ask the first question soon or? No, no. You're waiting. <laughs> Can I? Um, Sarah. Linda, Richard, we're delighted that you're able mm. to take part in our festival, if only online. Mm. It's a pity we can't see you live in Swindon, because Swindon in the spring is comparable to Paris in the spring. Mm. Not like <laughs> the same rainfalls and the same sunshines. Um, in fact, have any of you ever been to Swindon? Do you know anything about it? Yes, I yes. performed, actually. Um, sorry, Richard, were you going to say something then? After you. Mm. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thank you so much. So yes, I actually performed um, at uh, the Festival of Literature, mm -hmm. yours. And uh, that's when I actually, I think that's probably the first time I had come to Swindon. And then uh, I had the bug of the farm, able to stay in a 400 year old farm. It was phenomenal, fantastic. And then that allowed me to come again last year. Um, and uh, yes, absolutely wonderful. But that, oh, that came from Matt Holland. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, shall I go next? Um, well, um, uh, I, I first came to Swindon, I think when I was 11 years old. Uh, uh, Swindon's a famous railway town. And, and, mm. and, and at age 11, I was a train spotter. And, um, <laughs> and I, I came on a tour of the, uh, the, the railway works in, in Swindon, I, I, which I thought was incredibly exotic and uh, mm. wonderfully, um, you know, industrial, kind of the, the end of the, the, the industrial um, uh, st steam age, really, in, in Britain. And um, <laughs> so, so, since then, I, I've come to become very familiar with the, the Magic Roundabout, of course. And, um, and uh, I've, I've played in Swindon a bunch of times. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many times, but mm. uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, you know it's it's also the, the gateway to the West. I always think. <laughs> Richard, you sound like a fan of Swindon. We love it. <laughs> uh, it. There you are on the other side of the Atlantic, and you speak like a local, like a local lad. Um, Linda, what do you know about Swindon? Well, I came to I came to live there many years ago because I went to work at Lower Shore Farm, live and work at Lower Shore Farm. Um, that's the only reason I came to Swindon. I wouldn't have thought of coming otherwise, and I'm still there today well not quite because i'm in cornwall this week but yes i'm still there and enjoying sp springtime in swindon there's nothing like it is there matt 
brilliant. Thanks very much, <laughs> Linda. And this farm that Sarah and Linda both refer to, Richard, is the HQ of the Swindon Festival of Literature. It's mm. on of Swindon, and it has ducks and hens and pigs, and mm. it loves literature, it loves music, and it has a fireplace in the middle of the yard where we sit around doing our best to cover certain Richard Thompson songs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we might have to pay royalties, watch out. <laughs> um, Richard, uh, I know you've been to many music fe music festivals before. Um, have you ever been to a festival of literature before? Uh, yes, I have. I I've been to the um, Hay on Wye Festival uh, some time ago. Um, as a you know, as a as a fan, I happened to be in the area, and I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity um, to to check out some some groovy authors, and um, I enjoyed it very much. Um, it was it was uh, delightful. Um, I haven't been to the Swindon Festival until now, um, and uh, I'll put it on my to do list for uh, future years when I can <laughs> come uh, in person. Yeah, that's great. I mean, what it what that makes me think is that this may be your first appearance as an author at a festival of literature. I want to somehow claim a first, Richard. And um, we have a we have a first with David Attenborough. He came here. He, this was the first literature festival he came to. So I'm going to claim a first with you. Is that all right? That's that's fine. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Not a problem. OK, we better get to the topic at hand. Your book, Beeswing, Fairport, Folk Rock and Finding My Voice, 1967 to 75. And it begins with these lines, beautifully written book, by the way, but it begins with these lines. There is dust, and then there is dust. It's thickest here, here in my memory. This remotest room of my mind has been shut up for years. The windows shuttered, the furniture covered with dust sheets. Um, Richard, perhaps you could kick us off by telling us how you came to remove those dust sheets <laughs> and write the book that you said once you'd probably never write. Uh, I, I had a friend in Los Angeles. I, I, I was living in Los Angeles and uh, a very fine journalist, uh, Scott Timberg, um, journalist and author. And uh, he said, you know, there's a book you really should write. You know, you should write about this particular decade of music. You were there, you saw it all, you rubbed shoulders with God knows who. Um, this would be interesting. And I said, well, I really don't want to. And he bugged me for several years, actually. And then um, when I started writing it, I, I found it quite enjoyable. And uh, um, as people who, who, who write memoirs probably know, um, once you start thinking about a certain time period, uh, your memory unlocks. And more and more things come out mm. and uh it, it, you know it's only occasionally that, that i had to re rely on um other people's memory where, where, where mine was um somewhat mm. missing um due to drink or substances at the time um but th that was the 60s so i, mm. I have, a, have a good excuse so that, that was really the, the, the process mm. and 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 sitting down to write it because you write songs but yeah. writing long chapters with quotations at the start, um, with descriptions, how how was that? Um, well, it was fine. Um, you're correct in, in saying that you know that, that you can write a song in in a few minutes in some cases. I wish it happened every day, but it doesn't really happen every day. Mm. Uh, but it's it's plausible to, to write, write a song in, in you know twenty minutes. Um, mm. and, and history is littered with fine examples. Um, but uh, you're not going to write, you know, something of, of sort of Tolstoyan um, proportions in um, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, are you? So uh, it, it is a more disciplined uh, process. Um, but um, I, I've always been a fairly disciplined songwriter, so um, mm -hmm. I, I don't mind getting up at seven o'clock every morning and 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 getting down to work and, and doing two, three mm -hmm. hours of writing and, and mm -hmm. then um, you know going on to life's other uh, pleasures. But um, uh, I enjoyed the process and, and it wasn't too much of a shift. I mean, that's amazing to hear you say that, that, that you enjoyed writing because uh, early in your book, you say in the spring of 67, I just turned 18 and there was another kind of dust in my life entirely. So thick, you could see it hang in the air, composed of 50% chalk, 30% boredom, 
and 20% dull amusement. The dust of school stays in your lungs. Um, you didn't get on with school too well then. <laughs> oh God, I hated school. Though. It just seemed, seemed like you know, incarceration. Um, I couldn't wait to get out. If, if I could have left school at 12, I would have been very, very happy, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, hitched a ride on the gypsy caravan or something and just gone off around the world. I would have been delighted to do that. Um, no, I, I found school a real imposition. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've avoided institutions ever since. In fact, I've avoided wearing a tie ever since as well. Um, <laughs> I just... <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not good at being caged up. I, I wouldn't be good at an office job. You know, I, I'd rather mm. be, um, you, you know, working as a gardener or something than, than having to work in an office. Mm. Uh, mm. Something a bit more free and out in the air and, uh, you know, at one with nature or something. Mm. Oh, Richard, you sound like a kindred spirit. The, 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 <laughs> the, the best of this festival starts at dawn outside with bird song, uh, human song, uh acrobatics and fresh air and look no ties um, <laughs> linda, <laughs> linda apropos of those early years linda mm. Um, mm. um you were you were talking to me earlier about you wondered well you asked the question about, about yes well okay i'm going to begin right at the beginning um what lit the guitar playing flame in your brain richard uh, what, what lit the guitar flame? Um, it was it was the fifties, first of all. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was the rock and roll era, and um, the, the people who, who, in my mind, were being cool were the mm -hmm. ones that on TV uh, uh, posing with, with guitars. You know, <laughs> people like people like Joe Brown uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you see people, like, people like Eddie Eddie Cochran. You know, mm -hmm. Elvis on film. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, these people had guitars, so that immediately seemed seemed wonderful. And, 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 my, and my big sister um, had the records, so I yeah. could actually hear the music. Mm. And the music was, um, a, you know, um, a, a generational leap, really. Uh, it, it wasn't like your parents' music. Yeah. It was uh, exciting and it was raw and it was a bit antisocial and a, a little bit dangerous, all yeah. of which appeals wonderfully to, to, to uh, kids, you know. Um, but um, my father had been a, you know, a, a kind of not very committed uh, guitar player. Mm, uh, mm. Besides being a policeman, he was, he was a, you know, sort of an amateur guitar player. Mm. And at some point, a guitar turned up in the house, uh, and I kind of grabbed it and started playing it. And um, you know, and in the background there were, were, were my dad's wonderful uh, records, um, Les Paul records, Django Reinhardt records which I yeah, only kind yeah. of half paid attention to. Rock and roll seemed more exciting, but, but there was this other stuff in the background as well. So I was kind of soaking up lo lots of uh, guitar stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. In a different household, uh, I would have become like, a, you know, a, you know a, a, a core anglais player or something, or, or, a, <laughs> or a pedal steel guitarist or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Um, but um, that was the spark, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Because it seems that um, that's even when you play today, you can hear that sort of driving force of rock and roll somehow still lingers there. Is it still there in your playing? I mean, uh, I, th I think it is. Um, mm. Even as an acoustic guitar player, I think I'm quite aggressive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I like to kind of attack mm. the audience. Um, that, that sounds a bit, a bit rude. Um, it does. Not really. You know, r r rock and roll is about attitude and it's about mm. stance mm. and, and um, Mm. And I never got over that really. Um, no. So you know, my heroes are still you know Gene Vincent and uh, you know Jerry Lee Lewis. You know the the, the bad boys. Uh, and you can still hear a bit of rockabilly going on there, a bit of Scotty Moore. You know, just slight sort of <laughs> flavours of old yeah, Elvis. Um, absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think um, you know, becoming a, a guitar player in that mm. tradition, mm. Um, you never really. Escape from the from the mm -hmm. pioneers of that tradition. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. you're, you're always echoing, yeah. uh, you know, people like that. You're you're, you're even echoing people, um, you know, that go back to the 1920s, that, like Eddie Lang. You know, you're yeah, yeah. On the, you know, the yeah. great big Spiderback records. Um, so you sort of have soaked all this in and uh, have come up with your own, you know, pretty well unique style. But it's all there, isn't it? And they're bubbling away somewhere. I hope so. Yes, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you are the sum total of the uh, 
influences that you you choose to listen to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that covers a huge range. I mean, I listen to classical music, I listen to jazz, I listen mm. to mm. You know, a broad spectrum, and hopefully all that goes into your playing. I do have one question just to ask you about about your performing, and that's, um, you know, to me, when I've hear, heard you play, it sounds fresh every time. You know, you never come across as a parody of yourself. And you must have played these songs so many times. And we sort of wondered how, you know, you have this driving, pounding rock and roll energy behind the songs, as I just said. But it seemed that must require a lot of energy. How do you keep up that momentum? Um, well, to keep performing, you've got to be fit in various yes, ways. Yes, yeah. And you also, um, you have to have that, that drive, you know, to, to mm. perform uh, mm. and, and to write music as well. Um, you know, you have to keep, uh, you, you know, your, your voice going, you have to keep your fingers going. Mm. Uh, you have to be able to stand up, uh, yeah. preferably stand up. Uh, you have to be able to travel. Mm. Um, I mean, it's uh, tremendous, uh, yeah. Yeah, all of that, all, all those components. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and as I was saying about attitude, you know, you have to have mm. a, a certain uh, way of, um, of, uh, of, of dealing with the the live process um, mm. as well as the recording process you know so, mm. so you have to have a a way of being on stage and uh i always think a way of being humble on stage mm. and thinking of yourself um as a component of the evening's entertainment rather yes. than it's all about me yeah uh, I, I really think that everybody who comes to a show uh are contributing to yeah. the, the overall uh, mm. uh, performance yeah, uh, and, and uh, as, as as the as the musician, you're just the conduit mm. through which the music comes mm. out. Mm. But everybody is, is a participant. Now, there's a collective thing that happens mm. uh, at a concert that makes it so rewarding as a musician to, to be part of that. Um, and that's why I keep doing it because I absolutely love that process. And it's also rewarding as a member of the audience um, listening. Yeah. So. Mm. Um, Linda, Linda has, has, has caused you to leap right forward to, to what it's like playing for a long time. But just if we could take one step back to your, your, your school days or post-school days, when you met um, Ashley and Simon, the, the, the co-founders uh, of Fairport with you. And in the book you say, um, the only time I felt engaged was when I was with Ashley and Simon, my musical companions. I knew I would feel free and fulfilled if I could live that life all the time but in 67 that did not seem an option the only future that my parents and those were the parents who tried to give you plastic ukuleles and and uh and, and, and uh, roy rogers mini guitar <laughs> and so on, uh, but he's, he's say that the only future that my parents and society permitted me to be involved in was a proper job and you even write down accountancy banking so how did you make it from a, being a prospective banker uh, to to the next step. Uh, I don't know how I got away with it, really. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I think I, I was always destined for the arts, uh, and uh, probably I would, would have ended up at art school <clears throat> if, mm -hmm. if, if I hadn't got mm -hmm. into music. Um, and in my uh, sixth form at school, I, when I was doing my A levels, uh, I, I just finished the A levels, and um, a local uh, graphic designer. Um, uh, came by the school and, and said, Any, anybody want temporary work until they go to university or whatever? And, and I, 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 I volunteered. Uh, that was uh, a guy called Hans Unger, who was a, quite a famous um, poster designer, um, um, did, did uh, Keep Britain Tidy, all, all those kind mm. of posters. Oh, yeah. uh, they did a whole series for, for the GPO, for the post office at the time. And, and he did uh, lots of posters for London Transport, some of which are now in, in museums. I mean, extraordinary good stuff. So, so I got hired to work on this big uh, stained glass project. And, you know, probably for six months. Uh, and, and while I'm doing that, uh, Fairport takes more and more shape as a band. And we start to get more and more bookings to the point where I think, um, okay, we're, we're, we're actually just about professional as musicians. So, so let's, uh, let's go with that. I'll, I'll give up the stained glass and we'll, uh, roll forwards as a band and uh, I think we were fortunate at that time because there were so many places to play you know live music was such uh, uh, a thing in people's lives in those days 
and every university in Britain had an entertainment budget. Uh, and so Fairport would be playing, you know, four or five nights a week uh, all over Britain um, on co-bills with just about everybody, you know, the crazy world of Arthur Brown and, uh, you know, Blossom Toes and, and the Moody Blues and the Small Faces. I mean, uh, you could be on a bill with absolutely anybody, that any, any of these uh, venues. And, and there were lots of really great clubs around London as well, uh, the Middle Earth Club. Uh, we played the Speakeasy Club a lot of times. Um, so um, there was no shortage of work. Um, and I suppose we were lucky that we came out at the time that we did. The, 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 there was that um, opportunity to just get out there and play. And, and rock and roll apart, you actually already were developing quite a wide musical taste because when you worked with Hans, um, who was a refugee from Nazi atrocities, um, mm. you were listening to a, a piece of Wagner, I think, at one time, and, uh, and you were amazed that he liked it. And, and you asked him, you know, why he could, he could enjoy that kind of music. And he apparently shrugged his shoulders and said, nice tunes. And you both roared with laughter. Um, <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> I, I, I remember it very well. Well, I, I put it in the book, so I must remember it. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, I still get confused by, by, by Wagner, who, who was a bit, bit of a racist, I, I, I think. But, but, um, uh, but, but Hans uh, loved, loved Wagner, so I, I, shall, I shall forgive him to some extent. Uh, I'm still not a fan of Wagner, I, 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 I'm sorry to say, but, but um, I like the overtures. But, but you, do, you do go on to refer to lots of different musical uh, styles. It's amazing. Um, uh, okay, um, Linda, do you have another um, music-related question that you'd like to ask? I'd like to ask about the songwriting process, if that's okay. Um, and um, I just wondered, um, can you remember the first song that you ever wrote? Um, yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> um, I think I wrote it when I was 15. I, I think it was mm -hmm. called Yvonne. Yeah. In the great tradition of, of songs with girls' names, I, I thought yeah. well, no, one's, no one's done that one. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, oh, Yvonne, I really can't go on, you know. Um, <laughs> it, it's really but but, but I, I forgive myself for being um, um, naive at that point. Um, the, I think the next thing I did was I, I set a, a poem of Louis McNeese to music, uh, oh, yes. a poem called The Sunlight in the Garden. Mm. And, uh, and I thought that was quite good, actually. That wasn't bad at all. And it's a beautiful poem actually to sing but not mm. many poems you can sing yes really uh but but this one actually fits quite nicely uh you know you can wrap your tongue around it quite quite easily um and, and then the next things i wrote were, were actually in fairport as when yes. i was like yeah. 80 so i was i was minutely more mature and i think i, I wrote uh, meet on the ledge which has become something of, of a um of an anthem um yes, yes. Uh, when, when i was 18 so <laughs> I'm still going. <laughs> but I, 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 I still haven't got it right. I'm still practicing. Well, I was going to ask you that. You know, has has um, has it changed? You know, the way that you write, you know, has have been writing over the years. I mean, has it changed much from those days? Uh, I think I can write more efficiently now. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I used to uh, have a rock and roll um, hours. I, I, you know, I I I'd, um, I'd get up about noon. Mm. And I got to oh, yeah. about four in the morning, mm. and um, so I'd start writing about midnight, and uh, but 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 then I, I'd get too tired to, to keep going. So, so my my writing window is very small. Mm. But as, I got, as I got older, I, I I started getting up earlier, and um, you know if, if if I start writing at seven, then you know I, I can write a few hours, and if it's going well, I can keep going. And if it's going great, I can keep going after that, and I, I can write all day. And I've got you know eight wow. hours, ten hours of, of, of writing time. Um, so I've become more efficient. I'm also better at, at getting to the place where you start to write. You yeah. know, get, 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 getting to the get, get, getting your foot on the on the bottom of the ladder. Mm. Yeah, you mm. know, first, first you've got to find the ladder. In Do you have bottom. to put a switch on? Am I your songwriting switch on, and then turn it off, or is it on all the time? Uh, I think it's on all the time. It yeah. should be on all the time. Yeah. Uh, some um, uh, short story um, teacher w w was saying, mm. uh, you know, it's like you, you run a, a corner shop, mm. and you, you, li you live upstairs in the shop, uh, and you, but you keep the light on all night just in case somebody wanders <laughs> in and wants something. <laughs> yes. uh, 
I, I, I love that analogy. Mm, it's a good way of putting it. Um, mm. um, Richard, you um, you quote Deke Sharon, who, uh, who says, there are times in life to play it safe. I'm sure you can think of several, um, but music is not one of the times to play it safe. And you describe lots of friends around you, and I won't name names, other people can see them in the book, who are drinking and you're drinking and partying, so on, but also on the side, you are reading. And you're reading all sorts of texts, including Zen, Gurdjieff, um, I Ching, and so on. And and there's a little shift taking place, I felt, as I was reading. And I wonder if um, if Sarah wants to come here and probe a bit further, um, or you want to volunteer something, Richard, and what where your reading took you. Um, it, where, where did my reading take me? Um, well, all over the place, really. Um... I became interested in, uh, you know, philosophical and, and spiritual uh, things, um, uh, probably around age 14, 15. And I started to read as a result of that. And I started to read things like Zen Buddhism and um, anthroposophy and, yeah, Madame Blavatsky and, and God knows what. I mean, I just went through the whole range. Uh, and, and I somewhat paused um, in, in my research uh, at uh, uh, the, uh, the Sufis, uh, at uh, the letter S on the shelf, you know, um, um, and uh, I, th I think I, 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 I realised that um, that was um, uh, an interesting source of, of knowledge, and, and that these people seem to know something um, that I wanted. You know, Richard, you remind me of. You know, those Arabic calligraphists who lament at their art at old age and they've never been able to perfect it, you know, and it feels just from listening to you that your your book, you, it will never close, you know, you will continue with what you're sharing. Every moment is is current, even though it's the past and the present, it feels like you will like that calligraphist will continue, you know, there's, we'll, I, I, I describe it as being an, an imperfect perfectionist, where you think you, you feel you've got it, but it's not there. And you carry on and you carry on and you carry on until we drop. <laughs> you know, you remind me of that. It's just, it's beautiful to hear. And I'm, I'm fascinated by, by the fact that you, as myself, as a Sufi, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, when you, the, the moment you mentioned of you knew that school was not for you and it was the same thing for myself and I knew school was not for me and it always happens to the ones that are from the arts we know it from a very small age and I knew from a very small age that that it, it wasn't for me too mm. you know and um but uh but but I think it's the wings you, we, we we fly away no matter what no matter how you feel cooped up you, you try and fly, even if it's in a cage, you still try and fly with those wings. And and honestly, Richard, I, I feel rather in awe that I'm in this presence listening to you. Um, mm. Yes, I, I don't have a question, I'm listening. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, perfection is a kind of a false goal. Um, you know, the, they say about uh, the, the really good, uh, you know, Persian uh, rug makers, uh, they, they, they always deliberately add a mistake to, to the rug to, 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 to show that perfect, perfection belongs to God and, and we're just human. Um, yeah. but, but, but I think you always try to do your best. And in some sense, you, you can be temporarily satisfied, but you're never totally satisfied. And you always know that, that there's something further. And, and that, 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 that keeps you on the road, that, that keeps you looking and keeps you striving to do better. Um, for me, I always want to see what's around the next bend, you know? Um, it's just fascinating to, to think, well, you know, where, where else can this go? Mm -hmm. well, what, are, what are the possibilities? Uh, and music is so vast, really, that uh, there's no end to, to that, that looking, that search. But, uh, you know, music is, is it's spiritual stuff, you know? Um, Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it, it's so connected to, uh, to uh, you know, the, the the, the, beyond the universe, it, it, it's it's so um, it, it so reaches beyond uh, the, uh, the 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 um, the concrete, you know, uh, mm. of the world. It, it, it reaches into the finite. Yes, you yeah. say something very real and concrete in the book. You said 
uh, apropos of, of Sufism, you said, when I started praying, I gave up drinking immediately. I stopped on a sixpence. I found solace in the Sufis who were also musicians and who understood both worlds, the world of the spirit and music. Mm. And they tended to be down to earth and not sanctimonious. They actually had a sense of humor. Um, Sarah, Richard, Sufis, a sense of humor? Yes. Tell us more. <laughs> For me, it's very easy to be able to say that I am Sarah the Sufi. And the reason why is because the Orthodox, the Orthodox uh, Muslims, they call me crazy. And so uh, in a sense, it's brilliant for me to be able to say Sarah the Sufi, then let me go. I'm free because I'm a Sufi and Sufis are strange and they create me crazy and we mix music. Uh, which is uh, for many oh, parts of uh, uh, of the faith it is what we, they call haram, mm -hmm. you know, and it's uh, not permissible. But for me, I sing because I sing with the galaxy and I sing with the universe and I and I recite in a melodious manner. How can I not say it's sing, singing? I am reciting and I am singing and I will openly declare it because God is beautiful and everything about God is color and music and, uh, and, and rhythm. And I will not deny it within myself. So if you want to call me a crazy Sufi, call it me. I'm proud to admit and accept it. Um, thanks, Sarah. Just I wanted to hear from Richard on that as well. But, but just before you do, um, Sarah will also be performing at the festival later in the festival. And uh, we'll see some of that uh, crazy. <laughs> it's not at all crazy. And Richard, what would your response be to the the human uh, I, I, I think for human beings, uh, music is uh, food. It, 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 it's food and drink. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it, it keeps it keeps human beings alive, uh, and uh, you you can't deny people music. Um, I I really dislike uh, um, uh, uh, puritanical um, uh, approaches to to any any religion, and I tend to avoid people like that. Mm. Um, and uh, I think someone said about about Puritans. Um, uh, yes, they'll get to heaven, but but they won't know that they're there. That they won't realize that they're there. You know. Uh, so what's the point of that? Mm, so uh, I'm I'm all for joy in life. Absolutely, joy, joy, joy. <laughs> That's a great thing to hear, Richard. Um, we we're sort of heading for the end. Time just flies. Um. um uh, um, I wonder if Linda has another musical question, but, but just before that, um, I want to also quote something else from your book. You say, the greatest reward for me is when someone comes up to me after a show and says, hey, Richard, I really got that song. It spoke for me. Um, uh, beware, because I'm about to say, as I read your book, Bee's Wing was at the top of every page. And I've seen Bees Wing 289 times. Um, uh, my background is Pete Seeger, Chuck Berry, then moving on to Steel Eye Span, uh, then Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan uh, with, with wow. Richard Thompson on the fringe. And then when I came across Bees Wing, I was smitten. So this is the festival director just hinting that if we were able to hear Bees Wing to end the show that talks about the book Bees Wing, um, we would say to you, that song spoke to me. Um, but Linda, I'll now let you ask a final musical question and give Richard a chance to think about what I've just said. <laughs> not, I've, I've actually got two. I've got a, a question, uh, a more sort of flippant question, and I have a more serious one. So um, which would you like? <laughs> wait, wait uh, oh, um... Let's have the light-hearted one, please, Rich, uh, uh, Sarah, uh, Linda. Well, the light, the light hearted one, it doesn't feature in the book. Uh, but a friend of mine asked, um, asked me to ask you, he said, how the hell did you get to write Vincent Black Lightning 1952? <laughs> <laughs> That's not, I mean, and uh, but actually, um, my husband sings this song in, uh, sometimes around the fire at Lower Shore Farm. And oh. he, he introduces it as a song. He says, this is, this is the best song ever written. It's about love, death and motorbikes. <laughs> um, yeah, that, 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 you know, that, that's a very un unfair question. Uh, you know, how, how do you get to, to write write something? Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I grew up with traditional music, and so uh, it's not. 
Sorry, Richard, you need to unmute. You need to unmute yourself, Richard. Thanks. Okay, how's that? Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yes, good? Yeah, it's good. Perfect. Okay. Um, it's a very unfair question to ask. Um, <laughs> uh, the song isn't that far removed from a you know, 17th century uh, Scottish ballad or something in its form. It, it just has more contemporary stuff in it. Um, so uh, it's just me updating that model and uh, writing about something that obsessed me when, when I was a small child, when my neighbor had a Vincent Black Shadow motorcycle. And I thought, well, that's the sexiest thing I've ever seen. That's a gorgeous object. And, um, you know, many, many decades later, um, that thought came back to me. And I thought, well, that's a great thing to hang a song around, you know, to, to, uh, to, to be the kind of lodestone around which uh, the characters can revolve. So that was really um, the origin of that song. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, would you like me to play, play a bit of Bees Wing? Would that be a good oh, thing? We, we, we'd love Bees Wing in its entirety. We've got perfect five minutes and five seconds for it, which is absolutely spot on. Okay, let me see what I can do, see if I can remember it. <laughs> okay. Seen when I came to town, they caught it the summer of love. We were burning the heifers, burning the flags, the hawks against the doors. I took a job in the steaming down on Cardin Street. I fell in love with a laundry girl who was working next to me. Oh, she was a real thing, fine as a bee's away. So fine a breath of winds but blow her away She was a lost child She was running wild She said as long as there's no price of love I'll stay And you wouldn't want me any other way Zigzag around the face When I look at half surprised Like a fox caught in the headlights There was on a You said you're mine Oh kind, just I'm not the factory kind Don't take me out of here I surely lose my mind Oh she was a real thing Fine as a bee's away So fine that I'm a crusher she was a lost child She was running wild She said, as long as there's no price for love I'll stay And you wouldn't want me any other way So far. 
Because since uh, you asked me to come on this uh, amazing thing, I was listening. I've been listening to it live, not live. Just uh, I've been a little bit crazy about it, and I felt like he was singing it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's interesting, if you don't mind me saying so, Sarah, you're um, Linda, Richard, and I, without giving ages away, are very close in age, uh, and you're you're you have fortunately you have many years on us. Um, but it's great that you feel in tune with what Richard offers us. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Honestly, it's, mm. it's fantastic. And everything is, is you're, you're like a child. Every day is, you're like a child. And I'm sure it is the same for you, Richard. I bet you feel like you've not learned anything and you're still wishing to learn. Every day is a new day. Absolutely. That, that's the way it should be. Yes. <laughs> um, Rich, Richard, um, thanks very much. Sorry to put you, put you on the spot there, but just what we needed. Um, we wouldn't have it any other way. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Uh, Richard's book, um, Bees Wing, with a subtitle, has terrific chapters. It has 14 chapters with terrific titles, almost mysterious, like Eggshells, Just a Roll, Return of the Fly, uh, and then chapter 14, Bees Wing. Um, get it, read it. It's, it's, well, I nearly said it's rock and roll. No, it isn't. It's a bloody good book. Um, guest interviewers, Linda Lee and Sarah Yassin, the Swindon Festival of Literature thanks you. But most of all, a Swindon Festival of Literature thanks to Richard Thompson. Richard, many thanks. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Linda. You so thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.